Well, thank you. It's wonderful to be here with you guys here and study through God's Word together like this. It's been a while since I've been to Coastline, and such a privilege always to come back and be a part here with the group. And so um, it's just great to be here with you. And so greetings from the state capital of Florida, Tallahassee. So, uh, so uh, if you got your Bibles, and if you already turned there, Psalm 139, Psalm 139. Let's pray, and let's God to bless our time together in the Psalms. Father, thank you that you're present right now, and Lord, that we can open up your word, and your word will speak to our hearts. Lord, we're open and ready to receive all that you would have for each and every one of us in this place today. Lord, thank you for your presence. Thank you for the filling of your Holy Spirit, and just fill this place, Lord, now with your presence and your Holy Spirit, Lord, Lord, that we may have the capacity to do those things, God, that your word tells us to do. We love you, and we thank you so much for this opportunity, Lord, just to worship together as the body of Christ, fellowship together, and study your word together. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen, amen. This psalm has always been one of my favorite psalms. It's a psalm of David, and it's an incredible masterpiece of actually who God is and actually who you and I are in his eyes. And it all begins with his omniscience of God, which means the all-knowing of God. So if you follow with me in verse 1, it says this. It says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down, my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You know my sitting down. You know my rising up. You understand my thought. Now, That's kind of scary to think about that for a second. But he understands, notice this, he understands our thoughts. And I I think it'll be up here on the screen, afar off. Afar off. Now, you're thinking, well, does that mean like from five miles away? He can, no. Ten miles away, 20 miles away, 100 miles away. It's not that kind of afar off. It is actually, it means he sees my thoughts before they originated in my mind. God, you understand what I'm thinking before I ever even was thinking it at all. That's pretty far off, isn't it, for that? Now, now that can be a challenge, and that can be a consolation for us in many different ways. You know, we can say, Lord, you know my heart, you know what I'm thinking, and he does, no doubt. Lord, I wish I could do this, and he knows that's to be true. You see some kind of missions thing on TV or, you, or somebody comes to the church from the mission field, and they're sharing and showing video and things, what they're doing out there, and you're going, oh, Lord, I want to give to that. I want to contribute. Lord, I want to be a part of something of that nature. And he knows that from your heart. And he knows that is sincerely from your heart. And he saw that before you even thought it. Isn't that a great consolation in that area? But he also <laughs> knows we are thinking before we think it about getting ready to cuss somebody out, you know, getting ready to uh, give somebody a piece of my mind, getting ready to backhand somebody. He sees those, those kinds of thoughts also. And that's the thing is he sees those. He also sees those things. And the Bible says if we lust after someone, we have already committed adultery in our heart. If we're angry with somebody, we've already committed murder in our hearts. So he knows our thoughts in their origins before they ever came to the surface and manifested themselves. And what was in the heart and the thought was already sin before it even originated. That's kind of weird to think about it in that that respect. Before it was ever displayed or ever would be displayed, it was already sin. You know, as David is going to continue here in this psalm, He will be saying, you know me in this way, and you still want to be with me? Wow. It just blows him away. And that's how he's going to continue on with the psalm in that way. That is the amazing thing in the conclusion David will come to. You know me and all this ugliness in its origins, and you still want to hold me in your right hand. In verse 3, he goes on to say, you have hedged me. Well, actually, verse 3 says, you comprehend my path and my lying down. And you're acquainted with all my ways, for there's not a word on my tongue. But behold, O Lord, 
You know it all together. Not just our thoughts does he know in its origin, but now he also knows our words that I'm going to say before I ever am going to say them all together. You know, in Revelation chapter 13, it says this. It says, the lamb who was slain before the foundations of this world. Jesus was crucified before there was a world, before there ever was you and I on this world. God knew what, he was going to, what was going to happen before it happened. And thus, God knows what we think before we think it. God knows what we're going to say before we ever even say it. And before the worlds were formed in God's foreknowledge, he knew us. He knew us. And you can't disappoint him. He already knew what you thought. He already knew what you were going to do before the worlds were even formed. So you cannot disappoint him. He was probably disappointed before the world was even, you know, was even created then. But you can't. It doesn't surprise him at all when you do something or said something. He already knows all this, and he still chooses me and you. We are chosen in Christ Jesus. Not that we deserve it, not that we can earn it or anything like that, but it was a sovereign decision that God Almighty has made. So that can be a great help to us when we're, you know, walking around believing that God hates me, walking around believing that God's really disappointed in me. You know, I did this, I said that, and yes, we should be walking worthy of what God has called us to, the Bible says. He's got high standards, no doubt about it. And to reach those high standards of God, we really need the filling of God's Holy Spirit to even have a chance, to even have a way to even stand up or take a stab at those things. Yet, he has chosen you, <laughs> and he has called you in the midst of knowing all of our ugliness in its origin. I like what C.H. Spurgeon said. He says, I know that he chose me before I was born because he would have never chosen me after I was born. <laughs> and how true that is, huh? He is all-knowing in what I am going to think before I think it and what I'm going to say before I say it. Yet, he still has chosen me in Christ. He's chosen you in Christ Jesus. Know with me, too, there in verse 3, it says, He is acquainted with all of my ways. Basically, I can't even hide my electric impulses from him that are going in my brain. Those electric probes, those little flashes that you, you know, go through a person's brain when they're gathering an information, when they're retaining information, all those flashes, all that. I cannot even hide that. He's acquainted with all those impulses are not hidden from him. The platypus is a very interesting creature. I know we got a, a picture of one right here for you to look at. It's, it's, it's actually, they thought it was a hoax. They thought it was an experiment gone bad. They thought it was a, a, a Dr. Frankenstein kind of thing somebody was experimenting with. But this is actually God's creature and creation. It's got a duck bill. It's got duck feet. It's got an otter body. It's got a beaver's tail. And it's venomous. I mean, it's just a strange kind of animal, but God created this animal. Experts who study this creature could not figure out how they know where a worm is when they go through eight feet of water down into the mud and can find a worm or any, any kind of creature that they're going to eat. I mean, for the platypus has its capacity, actually what it does, it shuts down its eyes, shuts down its hearing completely so it can pinpoint with radar accuracy through water into the mud and get right to it. Not, it doesn't search around in the mud looking for it. It knows right where it is. I mean, they dive right for it. It was confusing to the experts. How do they do this? Well, then one day, you know, one guy was, scientist was accidentally dropped a battery into the water. And the platypus went right for the battery, got it, and ate it. And then they took another battery, and they buried it in the mud under the water, and another one came right down to exactly where it was to get it. Then they take a dead battery and throw it in there and... They don't care anything about it. Don't even touch it. Want nothing to do with it. 
See, God built in these electric probes that could detect worms or any kind of animal's electrical impulse. And when they shut down their seeing and their hearing, they got these little things around their beal area that actually is, is very incredible where they can just censor in on these types of things. So a platypus is acquainted with all of a worm's ways in a means. Like God's acquainted with all of our ways. Scientists cannot, with all of our technological advances today, they cannot detect the electric impulse of a worm. Yet a platypus can do it through eight feet of water and a few inches of mud. Can you imagine God created this being? Thus, he himself, no doubt, can detect our thoughts afar off. He knows all of them. The electrical currents of thoughts in our heads. He's acquainted with all of our ways. Now, I'm not trying to compare God to a platypus, okay? So I'm not doing that at all. Uh, but I am comparing us to worms. So we kind of fit in that category, right? <laughs> but the fact is, in verse 5 and 6, it says this, You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high that I can attain it. Still, with all that, you put this hedge about me, behind me, and in before me, which is in front of me. You protect me. You keep junk off of me. Now, we look at life and we say, you know, God, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? God, why did you allow this? Why did you allow that to take place in my life? And yes, there are testings, there are trials, there are difficulties. Every single one of us all face these difficulties Every day, that's just part of life itself. David experienced that as he was fleeing from Saul. He was hiding in caves. He believed that Saul was going to catch up to him sooner or later. He was stressed to the max because of that. But he writes this. He understands how much protection came to him from God Almighty himself. God was watching over me. He was protecting me. You know, the psalmist says there in verse 6 that I can't even know myself like you know me. You know me so well <laughs> that i not even attainable for a person. I can't know me as you know me. There's no way I could ever gain that kind of knowledge that you have of me. And so the first six verses is the omniscience of God. And now we move into the omnipresence of God, that God is everywhere. Look at verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwelling in the uttermost parts of the sea, basically, you are still there. The four extremes right here, heaven, hell, the extremes of the morning, the east, to the, the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, the west, where the sun will set, He's going to four extremes in that way. So that means everything in between, you are there. Even to the extremes, you are there. I can't flee from your presence. You are with me. Now, I think about Paul the Apostle in Ephesians 3. He was writing to the Ephesians, the church, that they would actually be able to comprehend, he said this, the width, the length, the depth, the height, the four extremes of God's love in their life. He wanted them to experience it, not just to know that that love existed, but experientially that they would be feeling that love. They know that love's there. And in the same way, it's that we would know his presence is there. His love and his presence is always there, no matter what extreme we may be at. Everything in the middle, he is there for us. We are covered. There is no escape. Verse 10, even there, your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall follow me, even the night shall be light about me, indeed the darkness shall not hide from you. But the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. <laughs> you know, when I read these three verses, I can't help but think, that comes to my mind, first thing is Jesus, the light unto the world. 
And Jesus said, God did not send me into the world, the darkness, to condemn it, but that the world through him might be saved. As it says right here, once again, it says this, even the night shall be light about me. The light of the world, Jesus Christ. The light came in the darkness, not to condemn, but to say, God so loved the darkness, the world, that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have everlasting life in that respect. So even though darkness shall fall upon me, it shall not hide me from you. So with the four extremes, we can't escape his presence. And even the darkest of the darkness, you know, he's still right there. It's, it's light to him. You know, think of Jonah. <laughs> How much darker could it get for Jonah when he was in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights? I mean, there was God's presence with him just waiting for him to repent and to turn and get on with his plan and also for the plan for the, the Ninevites there in Nineveh. You know, people will hide themselves in a dark bar, will find themselves a corner somewhere. You know, they think I'm hiding. But the very fact is, but you can't hide from his Holy Spirit because it can penetrate and bring conviction even in the most darkest moments and darkest times of a person's life. That darkness and light are the same to the Lord. He can just see a good, and, a good in the dark as he can in the light. As it says there in verse 12, the darkness and the light are both alike to him. With my presence will always be there no matter how dark. It may be. You sent your son into the darkness of this world to penetrate the truth of you, Jesus, the light into this dark world that we live in right now. I mean, think about this. How many of us here in this room, before Christ, we were clothed in this darkness, and all through that darkness, God's conviction by his Holy Spirit came to us in the midst of that. In darkness, he became light for you and I, and he came through for us in bringing us to Jesus Christ. Now, we go from the omniscience, the all-knowing God, those first six verses, then from there to the omnipresence of God in verses 7 through 12, and now we come before what he's all-knowing of you and I before we were even born, when we were hidden in the darkness of our mother's womb. Look at verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. Listen, you formed my inward parts. Now, this, this is deeper than just like, well, you made my lungs and my kidneys and, you know, my intestines and my liver. No, it's, 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 it's not that. It's deeper than that when he talks about inward parts. He's talking about who you are, that you and I were designed by God. He made you that. You were formed by God in who you are, that inward part. You know, what is there? There's there's like 7.23 billion people that are on this planet right now. And every single person on this planet right now is like a fingerprint. Each one is unique. Each one is different. Our fingerprints tell us that we're the only blueprint on this planet. We're the only one. You know, there's not a duplicate. Our DNA tells us we're the only blueprint. Our iris tells us that we're the only blueprint. God formed you with the personality (laughs) that you have. He formed you to like the beach instead of the mountains. Look look where you are, right? (laughs) He did that. He formed you to like rural living or like urban living. What it may be, you know, he has gifted you uniquely, all of us exclusively in that way. Maybe you're loud, maybe you're quiet, maybe you're a people person, maybe you're not a people person, you're extroverted, you're introverted, you know. You have covered me, he says, in my mother's womb. That word covered right there, verse 13. If you got your Bibles there, there should be a one in front of it. And if you go to your margin, it will say it means woven. It means braided in that respect. This could be, not to be dogmatic, but this could be the first time we see DNA actually mentioned in the Bible because you see those DNA strands, they're all braided 
like this, and they go down together. So it could be. It could be the first one. But each one of us, in the context of this, we're the only blueprint. We're the only blueprint. You formed my inward parts. You know, I have to admit, one of the most wonderful things I love about ministering to people is the diversity that's within the body of Christ. I like the uniqueness of people. I like the uniqueness that everybody is different. Not everybody's the same. And I have to admit, there are certain things about a person that can rub me the wrong way, like it can rub you the wrong way. But this thing called the body of Christ is like no other gathering in the world. (laughs) For God takes the most diverse people and makes them his sons and daughters, then makes us brothers and sisters in that respect. There is neither Jew nor Greek nor man or woman or free or slave or black or white or African, Asian, Hispanic, Russian in Christ Jesus. There's no organization on earth that is like the church. Paul says that God has fit us all together. Peter says we're living stones that are being placed together into a spiritual house. So God has made each one of us a -a one-of-a-kind blueprint that is not duplicated. And in that, he calls us family when we come to Jesus Christ. We are more than just an organization. We are an organism, a living organism, basically, is what we really are. So for me, I like the diversity of individuals in the church that are now my brothers and sisters. You know why? For God did that. This is God's doing. And even though sometimes some people can rub me the wrong way, that's still God's doing. And them rubbing me the wrong way might be God probably eventually putting them there just to rub me the wrong way because he's got some work to still do in my life. He's chiseling on me. He's working on me. And he's using that person to do that. So he made them that way. And he made them also for them and for us too in the same respect. Verse 14, and I will praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Our human body is a very interesting thing. It's a marvel. Any part of our body is a marvel to study by science itself, because it's so incredible. I mean, just take the hand itself. You know, it it is unbelievable, all the moving parts within it, and the connect to the brain, and how it all works, and so forth. You know, can science duplicate a hand to function like God made the hand? Absolutely not. A foot? Absolutely not. I mean, science can't do that. I mean, even if you transplant, it's still there's still something missing from it being 100%. We, as it says here, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I love that. The human body is this marvel. And to think anything other than God a creator, put it all together, is totally ridiculous. I mean, we, we evolved from another species? How can that be? Cats, you know, don't become dogs. Dogs don't become cats. A species remains within its species. You know, there is no proof or indication, or indication period of this ever happening. An ape becoming a human. You know, or worse yet, we came from ooze or some kind of a aniba of some type, and, but, and we're not fearfully and wonderfully made? He says it. Oh, we are. And the study of the Bible just tells us that so completely. You heard about science, right? It finally could create a human being. Yeah, they have advanced from test tube babies. They advanced from cloning. Now science can actually create a human being. And since they can create... They say, we have no need of God because we can now create. God said, wait, wait a minute. You can't create. They said, oh, yes, we can. And God said, okay, let's have a contest. Well, let's, all right, they agreed, let's begin. And so God grabs a handful of dirt. Science grabs a handful of dirt. And God goes, well, wait a minute. That's my dirt. Get your own dirt. You got to create your own dirt. I can't, you know, you can't use what I created. It's already been done. <laughs> in Genesis 1, 1, it says, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That word create in the Hebrew is bara. It means from nothing. 
God started with nothing, and he made dirt, and then he made us. All right, science, you start with nothing, get your own dirt, and see what happens. No, you're always going to need me. You're always going to need God. Look at verse 15. And he says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they were all written. The days fashioned for me, for as yet they were none of them. Now, here's how it goes in the NIV, these two verses right here, which kind of, it says the same thing, but it, you know, explains a little bit better for me to understand. He says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. In other words, all of our days were written out before we ever lived them. Now, that's kind of a hard pill to swallow sometimes. Lord, I have cancer, and all this has been written out before. Lord, my spouse cheated on me, and all this was written out before. It doesn't say he wrote it out, and that's why it happened. No, no, no. It says that he foreknew all these things. You know, David being threatened by Saul, his son Absalom is dead, who murdered his other son because he raped Tamar, his sister. This is what I get. This is the story you, God, wrote for me. No, that's not what he's saying. No, that's not it at all, what he's saying. All these days were known by God already. God, keep his hand on David's life to guide him, to protect him, to help him, to keep him in the worst of days. And just unfortunately, this thing called sin and our sin nature, you know, and, you know the fall of man's self, you know, manifests itself in our physical frame. And from the Garden of Eden, we have inherited this great difficulty in this world. But David is saying all of these days were written out before they ever were. My life, David said, is just a tale that has been told. That's our life, too, in the same way. You know, I think for myself, I, was, I became a Christian. I received Jesus Christ in 1970 in my senior year in high school. And I knew it was so, so real that I knew he called me to be in ministry. I knew that there was a call in my life. And so when I was graduating from high school, I wanted to go straight to Bible college. And I enrolled into a, uh, a Bible college. But I was only there for one semester, but then I started just to fall away and backslide and get totally away from God. I still believed in God, don't get me wrong, I didn't believe in anything else, but as far as church, as far as the Bible, as far as prayer, as far as Christians, I was totally backslid. I, I backslid so badly that I backslid all the way to Las Vegas, Nevada, <laughs> Sin City. I worked there in the casino business, in the gaming business for nine years. I had backslidden so far back in that industry, yet... He wooed me back to himself in those dark days in Vegas. His light was shining towards me. He was coming towards me and wooing me back, knowing me and knowing my thoughts and my action in those days, and he still wanted me. He still wanted me. It wasn't like me in Vegas took his breath away, and God goes, oh, look, another lemon. Yeah, well, another bad one. There he goes. Struck out on that guy. No, not at all. It wasn't like that way at all. No, he knew when I would backslide, and he knew the things I would do wrong, and he knows my failings, and he knows that, and he wooed me back anyway. All that was written out in front of him. It wasn't a mystery to him at all. He chose me. He loves me. He calls me his son. He keeps his hand on my life. He knows my internal struggles. He knows my anger. He knows my lustful thoughts. And he still wants to be with me, even though I'm wrapped in this fallen frame. You know, maybe you are here today. And it's because God is wooing you back. You walked away. You've been away. You backslid. But here you are here today. And he said, God's way of wooing you back. 
You are hidden in the darkness, but his light is starting to shine in, coming back to you. He saw you, and his light is shining in on you, and he loves you, and he wants you back, and he wants to be with you. He's not disappointed. He just wants you back. You're here today. That's why you're here today, because he's wooing you back. He's wooing you back. And this is what is so, so hard to reconcile, is that he knows us, and he still wants us, and he wants to spend time with us. I mean, think about the people in our lives (laughs) that got to know us. And as they got to know us, they want to spend less time with us, right? We know people like that, but that's not true with God. In our failures, in our sin, he still wants us, and he wants to spend time with us. This psalm, really, it really warmed David's heart. Because after all of his failings and his mistakes, and God still wants his, and his adultery and his murder, and he still wants to spend time with me. Jesus said the one that is forgiven the most is the one that will love him the most. And this is the wonderful thing about this thing that we're experiencing called grace. When we fail, we're not allowed to quit. This is the wonderful thing about grace. Yet the gospel of grace says you fail 10 times. You fail 9 out of 10 times. You fail 15 times in a row. Get up, dust yourself off, get going again. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us and wash us of our sin and all unrighteous. That's the Christian soap that we have, 1 John 1, 9. We, we, we got that right there for us. You see, once again, grace doesn't let you off the hook to give up and quit when you fail. A law, if you're under the law, you might as well just quit. But under grace, you can't. You can't quit under grace. Grace doesn't allow it. You just keep going. Because his love is there. He's bringing you back. No matter what we've done. Verse 17 says, How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. You know all of my days before I lived them out. And you know the sum of all of those days that I live out. You know, in Luke 12, it says that the very hairs of our head are numbered. Doesn't say they're counted, which would be a cool thing. Like, God counts the number of hairs on my head? No, it doesn't say that. You know, the average human has about 100,000 hairs on their head, you know, give or take, you know what I mean? But the average human, 100,000. But the interesting thing is, but it doesn't say they are counted, it says they are numbered. If a hair falls out of our head, That could be hair number 7,701. He's already counted it. He's marked it. He knows that one. That's even better than counting the hairs on our head. He's got every single hair on our head numbered. But calls that, he knows what that number is from us. How precious are your thoughts to me, it says. You know, sometimes in the hardest of days, we think he's kind of forgotten about us. He's cast us off. He's not thinking about us or his thoughts about us are any good. David says, no, he is all-knowing. There is nothing about us he doesn't know. There is protection before me and behind me. Even though he knows what I am, he still wants, and his thoughts towards me are always good. And it says about these thoughts in verse 18, if I should count these thoughts, if I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand When I awoke, I am still with you. The number of grains of sand in the world has been determined. It's something like 10 times 10 to the 28th power. Now, I'm not sure how to find out if that's true or not. I'm sure Google wouldn't lie, right? No, I don't know if it is or not, but that's what they've determined it to be. So the thoughts of the Lord towards us is more than the sands of the sea. And his thoughts are always good. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. For you have a future and a hope. His thoughts are always great and good towards us. But can you imagine you live to be 90 years old? That means every second, 
He's, he's, got a, he's got a thought of a good, positive thought to you every second of our lives, even more than that. Because 90 years of age is going to be way, you know, 10 times 10 to the 20 powers. I mean, that's, it's just, it's, it's, there's multiple good thoughts every second that he has towards you and I. Verse 19 says, oh, that you would slay the wicked, oh God. So we got a little shift taking place right here. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe them who rise up against you? Now, we know in the New Testament we're to love our enemies. We know that. Yet David is saying, I hate your enemies, God. But the New Testament is vastly different in this area than the Old Testament is. I mean, David was praying one time, God, break out their teeth. Was he praying, break out their teeth because something personal with him, or was it because they're enemies of God? I don't know. But he prayed that. Yet what David is saying, these enemies you will deal with. He's saying right here. These enemies of mine, they're enemies of mine, I know you will deal with them, for they speak against you, God. So they're enemies of yours too, because they are mine, because they speak against you. You know, and, and that's why he may be feeling that way. Look at verse 22. Here's an interesting verse. I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. I don't know what perfect hatred is. You know, you may be thinking, can I get that? Can I get perfect hatred? I think there's some people like that. No, no. I, here, here's, why, here's why I look at this. I got to work on love for the rest of my life <laughs> because hatred is so easy. But love is so hard, and God wants me to love him and love others. And so love is the thing I, I, I got. So I'm going to be busy for the rest of my life just learning how to love and be a loving person. I, I, know, I don't really know what perfect hatred actually is here at all. But I want you to notice now, notice his prayer in these last two verses. Look how this is awesome. This is his prayer for himself. I love this. Verse 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Last thing up here on the screen, know my heart. God, my prayers, you know my heart. It says that the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? We can't, but God can. David is saying there is no hiding that we can hide in the dark from you. No way. We can't fool you, God. We can't get over on you, God. You know everything, God. He knows that what I think before I think. He knows what I'm going to say before I say it. He sees me when I'm in my selfish, lustful, angry thoughts. He knows all of that, yet he still goes before me. He still goes behind me. He still encourages me. He still guides me. He still protects me. And in all of this, David was saying, you know, basically, that this is all too wonderful for me. You want to spend time with me. You want to be with me. I just can't believe all this. But here at the very end, there's a shift here. He ends it all with this new and fresh way and saying it like this. Lord, dig me up. Mind me. Search me. God, go down to those deep, dark places and maybe penetrate me, investigate me. I'm not afraid of that because I know how much you love me. I want you to do that. I want you to go in there in that way. Search me for any wicked thing. I don't want to live an unrighteous life. With all that you give me and all of this that I've been reading, and that, Lord, I, I, want to, I don't want to live that kind of life. I don't want to do that. And I don't know what's there. But maybe you know what's there. Find it. Dig it out. I'm going to give you the green light on this. And then once you find it, dig it out, then lead me away into the everlasting. Let's just go there together. You know, I might not even know that that's there, but I'm bright enough to know it can be there. <laughs> and now I don't want it there, even though I don't know if it is actually there. What a, what a heart to have. But I do know you know if it is. And if it is, rid me of all the wickedness. I want, a, I want a heart. I want a clean heart. I want a right heart. I want, the, I want that kind of heart. I don't, want to, I don't want to live like that. I want you to come in and do that, Lord. 
You know, how often have we been disappointed in ourselves? Quite often. We say, God, I'm sorry, I can't believe I acted that way, or I said that, or I did that. I'm so ashamed of myself. I thought I was over that. I actually promised you, God, I would never do that again, and I did it again. And the Lord says, I knew that about you all along. I knew that. You didn't know. You thought you'd arrived, but we haven't arrived. And David said, I know I haven't arrived. I want to know if there's something there. And with all these great promises, how much you love me, is there something there? Listen, this is the healthy attitude I need to gain like the psalmist has. When I know all this wonderful things about me and my relation with God and who God is and how he, how he views me. I want to be that, hey, I want to have that kind of, I want to be right on the inside. I want to be right with you. I know there can be some of the most disappointing qualities about me. I don't know if they exist, but you know if they exist. You know, Paul talks about in Ephesians about the very fact is, is that in the inner man, he said Christ wants to be at home in the inner man. You know, Christ in us, the hope of glory, he's in us, but he wants it not to be a visitor. He wants to be at home there in our hearts. You know, he wants to be able to put his feet up on the coffee table. He wants to be able to go through the refrigerator and eat whatever he wants, go through the pantry, eat whatever he wants, you know. He wants, he wants to be at home in our hearts. He wants to be so at home in our hearts that he says, let me have the remote. We're going to watch what I want to watch. We're not going to watch that anymore. Okay, it's your home. Dig it, dig it out, Lord. Dig it out. And after we get watching my program, let's go back in that back room, that closet back there. Let's see what's back there. This is my home. It is. Make yourself at home. That's what David's doing. I'm inviting you into my heart, to make yourself at home there and dig out whatever it is that can possibly be there. I know there can be some very disappointing qualities about me that I don't know exist. I want you to come to my home. But you know, and the Lord gets rid of it. Dig me up, mind me, and then Lord, then move me on to the everlasting. <laughs> so who God is and who he is with us would actually He's ending it to drive us for this incredible, righteous relationship with him. And that's how David ends this psalm. Know my heart.